Welcome to the Military Bottle Line Podcast, where we help you make the most out of your military contract. Today on the show, I have my friend Cody, who was my roommate during uh, time in the Marine Corps and happened to happen to spend some time in the brig, uh, but he was able to turn that, t- that time around and rebuild his reputation. And I think he's got like, a, a lot of good insight to share. Hope you enjoy it. Um, Cody, kind of let's, uh, let's introduce yourself and uh, tell us a little bit, you know, why did you join the Marine Corps? Um, why did I join the Marine Corps? I honestly just probably didn't, ultimately just to get out of Alabama. <laughs> I was 21 at the time. I didn't really have a career going for myself and, um, I planned on joining the military when I was younger, but I didn't because of a girl. Mm. I, yeah. I, uh, the Marine Corps was the one I wanted to join, but I didn't at a younger age because my parents and then, uh, you know, being older, I can make my own decisions and yeah, decided to go to the Marine Corps because I'm hard headed. Hard head <laughs> to end up being a yeah, good good like choice that. for you. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah. it's definitely probably a different experience than other branches would be, but it's it's not bad. I don't yeah. think personally. I, I like I said, I, I joined it specifically because I like to be challenged, and uh, it's a part of my personality. Funny enough, finding out it's probably because I have ADHD. But yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> if I'm not um challenge very very strongly on something and it's easy for me to lose interest so yeah that's why I, went I, that route. I hear you and you said i'm more challenging you joined at 21 you said yeah enlisted enlisted yeah. was that uh i mean i know for myself yeah, i was a, a fresh 18 year old um so i was i was easily um you know swayed into doing whatever they wanted me to do so <laughs> what was it, what was it like going in as a 21 year old with a little bit more life under your belt I think it does make a difference because normally you're kind of like, I think the younger you are, the more moto, mm-hmm. the, no other better word uh, you are, honestly. Yeah. Um, and not even just, I mean, obviously you're more ignorant being younger, but you're just, you know, you're looking for a specific experience. And whereas for me, um, I wanted to pursue a, a job that would lead to a career eventually. Cause I didn't pursue myself being a career Marine. Mm-hmm. And so um, I had a decent ASVAB. And so I talked over the options and I was weighing what would give me a career when I got out. Yeah. Smart. You no. Know, uh, so I, uh, I talked to the recruiter and I qualified, I qualified for much any job I wanted, but at the time they, you know, they put forward avionics or, uh, I think the second choice on the list was Intel. Mm-hmm. Really what kind of in retrospect, it have been kind of cool to go Intel, honestly, cause a lot of good work in that area, but yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I went to AVI because, I figured there'd be some good money in that. So eventually. Cool. <laughs> I mean, did, they let, did they let you sp- uh, pick your specific job or was it just kind of a, a broader category that you then kind of filtered through? I think uh, if I remember correctly, that's like a coding group, um, which uh, has a, a plethora of jobs under it. So um, mine was, was avionics, which could lead to several different careers. Um, and I believe I actually did choose radar for some reason, um, but I don't remember. But anyway, so I, later they gave me a choice. But uh, when I enlisted, it was basically just avionics and everything under that umbrella, which can be several different things after finding out what it yeah. can be, I guess. But, no doubt. And you ended up with radar, you said? What, is, what does that mean? When you go through AVI, you basically ran, randomly get selected into uh, I level, a, AE, or O level. I think your um, your GT score probably plays something into that as well from your ASVAB. Mm-hmm. I got put in the ISRAM, which is the uh, longest course. You, you you learn more about le- electronics than any other the other ones. And then dep- depending on where you graduate in the class, you get to pick your job from a list that they had available. Okay. So I was second in my class, and so I picked second. <laughs> and nice. I had, um, I had a couple of interesting looking jobs i chose radar because i had a very a high attrition rate and uh even more schooling so I mean, this is kind of following that suit of uh pursuing more challenges kind of thing was that the thought behind that uh challenge and also again employment i figured uh gotcha. something produce more college credits more education um and yeah i mean obviously the challenge was a, a big part of it as well but um it was tempting also to go cast tech there's a a job I think it's called cast tech and they basically a computer does your whole job for you so there's always that. <laughs> yeah 
No, I um, and also um, I mean, just being honest, I was I was still I was still twenty. I was twenty two at that time, I believe, and it meant I'd stay in Pensacola for nine more months mm-hmm. and have pretty. So I mean, <laughs> gotcha. all the weight into the decision, but you know, that's that's how I ended up in the radar. So. Gotcha. Cool. And it uh, yeah. it took you out to California, right, Pendleton? Yes, it did eventually. I got my orders. Um, same thing. Most, most, I think Marine Corps schools do that. That you, you get the, you know, your wish list of a region. You know, East Coast, West Coast, overseas, and then they put you on the one you least want to go to. Usually, <laughs> <laughs> really, D- did you have a preference? You weren't, yeah. you weren't hoping for California. I don't think I knew that. I had a, I had a uh, fiance at the time, so I was hoping for East Coast. Gotcha. Um, we internally, I wanted overseas. I always wanted to go to Japan. Mm. Uh, West Coast was probably last. I didn't even think about how awesome California would be. And luckily, uh, fate would have it that I went into the <laughs> uh, Yeah, could have been worse, right? Yeah, definitely worse place to be in Southern California for your duty station. Yeah, yeah no doubt. Huh. Yeah, I know, um, you know, I don't know, definitely don't want to touch on any sort of subjects, but I know that we, we met uh, right after right after you got out of the break. You ended up in the room right next to me. And uh Oh, yeah. you're the only person that I know that's ever been to the break. So um, it's, it's definitely, I think a unique experience that I wouldn't say people should strive to uh, experience, but it is, uh, it is a whole different part of the, the military that does exist. And uh, kind of yeah. curious to what your experience in that was. <laughs> There's a lot of rape. No, <laughs> don't drop the soap. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't drop the soap. <laughs> Or your toothbrush, or right now, um, that's just the guards. Now, uh, it's uh, it's honestly, it's like babysitting. Um, yeah. and you know, I went to pretrial, so I don't know. I can't tell you what Leavenworth or like an, you know a higher security brig would be. Um, yeah, let's just be straight. Big. This wasn't for war crimes or anything crazy like that. <laughs> no, 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 yeah. it wasn't for war crimes. I didn't kill anyone. Although there was actually some people in there for pretty serious things. Okay, um, they, a lot of times get end up separated once everyone found out what they did. Mm-hmm. Um, some guy killed his baby. There's a child molester in there. Like those kind of people would end up getting separated for their yeah. safety, I guess. Safety. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but most people were, you know, AWOL or popped on drugs or something. Just their unit just got mad enough at them to put them in the brig and didn't realize that most of the time the brig's actually easier than restriction. Um, yeah. But it's, it's, um, depending on your health, you'll work in their uh their uh, chow hall they have their own chow hall which is the same food that you eat when you're free and then uh every other day you work uh in the chow hall three times a day you make the food and then you serve it to the other um, detainees gotcha and so eating, everyone gets fat there pretty much <laughs> it you're still getting paid days you yeah 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 because it's pre-trial you actually haven't had any punishment yet so you're still getting full pay at that point sweet um, so it's just stacking stacking bills huh yeah. Yeah. You don't spend any money, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and it's, it's still, I mean, it's, it's, it's still, it has its problems. I mean, the, the water's pretty dang cold and no pressure mm. and with a single br- bladed Bic with no sh- uh, shaving cream is pretty not fun. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, everything's pretty clammy and cold. It, you have like, basically have the wool blankets from boot camp. Yeah. But like the AC, I remember the, it was winter time. The AC was supposedly broken the on position. <laughs> and it was so it was pretty frequent most of the time and the only nice shower they had was in the end dock uh cell bay and we, all the rest of them were like we, we had like um q-tips plugging up two of the uh the, the, the nozzles so you could have more pressure no kidding <laughs> besides that i mean I had a library did a lot of reading um yeah. said your off days you could sleep all day or watch tv or play spades yeah i mean it's probably it's I think it's significantly different than regular prison because you still have the commonality of everyone in there is a marine. Interesting. So, yeah. I mean, so the, it, it's just, oh, go ahead. There are no uh, there are no like courtyard fights or anything like that breaking out. Uh, there's some close stuff. Yeah. Um, they tell you um basically it'll add on to your sentencing. So most people oh, interesting. Really, um, and again, like most of the time, you're pretty cool with everyone for the most part. Mm-hmm. Uh, most too busy being pissed off at the guards to be mad at each other. Yep. Common enemy. Because when you have a PS, yeah, when you have a PSE or, or a private making you address them by their rank, it's kind of, um, 
unsettling to some people. I mean, we had a, a, a staff sergeant recon guy in there and sure enough, like the, the, you could just see the power that some of the guards would feel being yeah. able to trade him. Yeah. Um, it's just like, yeah, and unfor- that's unfortunate, but it, it is what it is, you know? I mean, mm. Yeah. How do you how do you feel like the, your your time there um, influenced uh, you like once you once you got they let you back out and you're kind of still you know still in the Marine Corps? Did it change you much or was it is it just kind of like well another day now I'm just going to my my old radar job like I was before? Uh, which time you know I was in twice. So. <laughs> oh, I was in the first the first the first time didn't change me very much. <laughs> I I may have uh, I may have forgotten that detail. Um, yes. Well, I, I guess you know maybe it, if it takes twice to uh, to learn whatever lesson they wanted you to learn, uh, I guess the second time around, um, like, did, did it uh, did it change things for you, or I mean, how how did that kind of play out? I would say no, because I had changed before um, disclosure. I, I went AWOL, and then I uh, yeah I, uh, I became a Christian the second time, and so I turned myself mm-hmm. in wolf. So I was already changed when I went into it. So it was a different experience in that sense. I was like like surprisingly upbeat and joyful hmm. <laughs> compared to most of my uh, roommates roommates uh cellmates i guess <laughs> it's like a big open it's an open squad bay yeah. uh, unless you're in special prison you actually have a cell gotcha but um no i mean that the changing for me was my faith but i mean uh i would say the interesting things that would change that probably in lieu of my faith would have been bad is um as much as like obviously people need to research finance before they go in the military, it would probably be wise to really look into the laws because mm. you learn a lot. Just the bad stuff they tell you as a junior marine. Yeah, like they literally everyone's been briefed on, uh, you know, you turn yourself in and tell the staff sergeant everything when you get in trouble in town. Mm-hmm. They don't tell you that Article Thirty One of the UCMJ um, protects you against self incrimination. It's the mm-hmm. same as a fifth amendment. So you still have that right in the military. I don't know if you should share this to your viewers or your listeners, but yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, you never want to encourage uh, <laughs> breaking the rules, but like, you know, if uh, if it comes to it, they should definitely know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I don't encourage breaking rules, but it's also good to know your rights. And um, yeah, yeah, you um, no, no matter how much they scream at you, as long as you are respectful. And there's there's different laws when you're deployed, but stateside, you can respectfully keep your mouth shut. Interesting. <laughs> Huh. You know, and that's uh, do what you want to do with that. I mean, they they might bring the hammer down on you more if they figure out what happened. But if you confess, then they know what happened. So it's kind of like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know a guy that, uh, yeah, he yeah. he got in trouble out in town, and you know, somebody got word of it, and he was just he was denying, denying, denying until it came up, and then obviously that didn't that didn't work out well for him. So, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, 50-50 you, you, <laughs> you might shoot yourself in the foot I, there. Uh, right, right. I, yeah. I'm, like I said, I won't go into too much detail on that. So, but yeah, I mean, I've, I've seen people. Yeah, I mean, I know a guy beat a urinalysis because he never invented to it, and, mm. and he got all his you know, nothing happened to him. So it's like, no well, kidding. So it's okay. like, yeah. So, anyways, that's the main thing I learned. Like, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff that um, people who are in higher ranks don't know about the law. Yeah. Um, in the military, and they even they'll act like they do, but then they don't. It's really interesting. Um, but again because i was a man of faith after that i didn't abuse it and i still respect authority um yeah i mean i I would say just that experience didn't probably affect me as much as it should have probably well obviously the first time i didn't yeah were you uh were you still able i mean did this affect like if you you said you didn't want to be a career marine initially but Mm -hmm. uh did it affect your opportunity to be one or um it would have made it harder yeah I uh, I got honorably discharged, so it didn't affect that. Mm. Oh, Lord. But um, there were some pretty good uh, circumstances, I guess, I would say. Um, yeah. Um, but uh, it did affect my reenlistment code. I'm an RE3, RE3 Charlie, so I do have to get a waiver to reenlist. Gotcha. I would have if, if, if you were to. at the time. Yeah. I were at the time, yeah. So it, obviously it did affect that. But as far as the civilian side, no, I mean, I can't really tap into those things. And it says armable discharge, and that's really all they care about. Cool. How do, how do you feel like, um, I mean, so if you had been in the brig twice, you had uh, experienced, like, I assume, different leaders through your tenure while you're in. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel like your, your different 
leaders uh, impacted you or reacted to the situation kind of whether it assisted or uh, was more detrimental to the outcome of, uh, of the situation? Uh, I would say um, my first shop had a lot of good leaders in it. Uh, the radar shop, they, they legitimately had some good leaders. They had some crappy ones too, but yeah. as a whole, um, they had some good leadership. Um, and not even the sense of like, oh, I got in trouble and I'm mad that you're mad at me kind of thing. I mean, one of them was pretty petty, but like the, I would say the worst leadership was that um, one of them and, um, sorry, he, uh, you know, he became friends with me and then uh, he, he, uh, kind of led me into more bad circumstances, I'll say, I guess. I mean, and decisions and partying and stuff. Um, but at the same time, kind of put on this, like, you know, buddy-buddy leadership style in front of everyone. Like, I mean, he was he was a good friend, but he wasn't a good leader, I guess. And that kind of, I guess, gotcha. important to fraternization at times. Mm. Which it can be okay, at, maybe not legally, but it's okay if you're leading Marines in the right direction. But leading them to party... The you know the to the um, neglect of their career is not good, but a lot of them were good. You know, every marine that came in that shop was molded into having a first class EFT and shown how to excel in the Marine Corps. Um, so you I want that. you want you want to explain fraternization real quick? Because I, I feel like okay. I didn't even know what any, that was before I joined. Um, and I was surprised that any civilians <laughs> listening or yeah. any or any uh, guys that haven't been in yet. Um. Basically, it's um, befriending or close relationships with people of a, technically, it's, uh, I think, by the legal terms, it's, uh, I want to say staff NCO or officer, but um, really, if anyone is out, well outside of your, your rank, probably could be classified that way. I mean, again, I'm, I'm not, strictly speaking, in the legal sense, but in the, in the sense yeah. of, like, the way work is supposed to function as if your boss is becoming your best friend it can really be bad gotcha you know, if they can show favoritism mm -hmm. or, um which honestly i don't think he did uh is more like making it okay to live a certain kind of way and then like putting on the, the face when you get to work the problem is you can only play the good guy and the golden boy for so long before you get caught up you know what i mean yeah yeah honestly yeah, he eventually got caught up too mm -hmm. so um would be, and, and, you know, I love the guy, but you know. <laughs> I know, I know, like, depending on where you're, what job field you're in, fraternization is kind of like, you know, it's more based on like the combat role where they don't want an officer or a staff, you know, NCO right. sending, sending some guy that they're not friends with into a, a sketchy situation instead of, you know, their boy kind of thing. So uh, obviously that's right. why the rule and the law exists, uh, but it exists like Marine Corps wider military wide uh regardless of what your job is even if you're not going to get in that situation you know yeah it's not always followed but you know <laughs> yeah when yeah. you know like I, said, I go i go both ways on it. i think it's it can be it's not actually bad to develop a good rapport with your subordinates or with mm -hmm. your you know and honestly like i said uh, the best leadership i had was the second time around when i was kicked out of the radar shop i ended up in logistics i worked for the s4 shop oh yeah yeah, we had a uh, Mustang captain come in, um, phenomenal Marine, just like the, like he's the kind of guy that, that Marines, you know, they'll say your leadership will determine if you reenlist obvious, off, often, well, that, or if, you know, you get married and have a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're not prepared, um, yeah. <laughs> if you're not prepared, which is most young guys yep. and girls. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, the dude was just like, he didn't hold my pass against me. He said, you know, you've done your time. If you work hard for me, I'll I'll do the same for you. And he just, you know, mm. he knew how to mo motivate Marines. And um, yeah, he just I learned a lot from him. Yeah. So yeah, it's definitely him. definitely a game changer. I think. Uh, I mean, leadership definitely influences, you know, pretty much your whole uh, your whole tenure in the military. And, you know, if if you got yeah. bad leaders, it's gonna be a miserable uh, <laughs> miserable yes. miserable couple of years. Um, but the opposite can be true also if you, if you do have, you know, solid people to look up to and that are, that are influencing you. So um, yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Sure. But yeah. even with him towards the end, he didn't, he didn't make you want to stay in, huh? Uh, I had some thoughts of it, but yeah. no, I mean, I said, I never intended to be a career Marine. Yeah. 
Um, and, and I thought the idea of it probably being pretty substantially hard for me to reenlist. I mean, I'm obviously not impossible with a waiver and who knows, I might've got one because of the whole command was pretty much liking me at that point. Yeah. Strange enough. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. I remember that. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then a lot of that had to do with me working in the four shop and them seeing me be a different person. Um, yeah. But, uh, and then honestly, my, my captain had a lot to do with that too. Hmm. But um, no, I couldn't see myself doing it as a career though, honestly, at that point. Not, you know, not to knock it if anyone else would have wanted to. There were some different, definitely some things I would have done differently, obviously, besides the horrible crimes I committed. But the, <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of, I, uh, I squandered um, that would have been better used for my future, honestly. I wish I would have had the sense to do. Hmm. But yeah, fast. <laughs> yeah i mean I, I think that uh i mean you've been out how many years now was it like five um no It'll be seven in november seven wow that's wild time flies man mm-hmm. um in in hindsight i mean what do you what do you wish you knew you know if you if you could tell your your younger self on your way into the marine corps <laughs> Other than don't go hey, AWOL. yeah, other than don't go a wall, um, you know things that uh, you yeah. wish that you had done better, maybe like uh, I would say, like in the you know the, the theme of your podcast, um, <laughs> uh, I would <clears throat> have uh, pushed more deeply into tuition assist or TA and like done some schooling on the side because there's you have a lot of downtime in MOS. Yeah. Um, for radar, most of our workload was done by Wednesday, and that's why honestly that shop out a lot of meritorious corporals and sergeants because there's like two and a half days a week where you don't have anything to do but train you know make math and do and it, you, have, um, you have a night shift too right which means like even less is right. happening then you know um, right yeah yeah so they have those those opportunities but even before that i would say you know um you know you have a lot of fun you make good memories partying but it's like man there's yeah. so money I, I would i would actually probably crap myself if i could go back and tally up all the money i just wasted drinking yeah. stupid stuff and yeah it's like, it man, it is you. uh it's just wild like i remember you know people pointing out to me when i was new like being able to tell when it was payday weekend versus <laughs> you know the off the off weekend and how many people would be in the gym or hanging around base uh because on payday weekends people would just be out spending mm-hmm. it you know and it's like man and when you see all the freaking dominoes coming to everyone's there, <laughs> I mean, yeah. our wing zone or whatever. Yep. Like that kind of frivolous stuff. And, you know, and some of it's not just, I can't remember the name of the book, but uh, there's like this theory that um, people from well-off families are not just well-off because they inherit money, but they inherit habits that their parents instill. Definitely. And I think I'm more, um, I wouldn't necessarily say we we're poor, but we were on the borderline, <laughs> you know, yeah you know, hand me down clothes. I, I, I say it like this, I've never gone without a meal, but my parents have. So, mm. um, but they also didn't know how to manage their money. Well, do and you so, feel like it's, I mean, can, but, can those, can those habits be learned or do you feel like, uh, it's already instilled in you? I think any, if you have a desire to learn mm-hmm. and absolutely, you know, absolutely. And, and you know, I'm, I've learned some of them. It's still harder. Some of yeah. that's, it means funny enough and not in a, excuse makings but i mean some of it is having adhd does make financial things harder in a lot of ways yeah anything along that line really um anything that has to do with executive function can be harder but i mean that's the beauty of having an awesome wife who's great at those things (laughs) (laughs) but i mean yeah i think it's um unfortunately because that is the i think that's the truth and i also think it's true that a lot of people who enlist probably do come from more poor backgrounds you know yeah you know and it's almost taboo to say that it's like you're you're you know you're blaming poor people and it's like i'm not blaming them in the sense of like they're horrible i'm saying that it's it's just as inherited wealth so it's mm-hmm. not your fault that you haven't been taught to spend money you know, I'm, I'm actually money <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm reading outliers right now by malcolm gladwell have you read that i have not uh it's 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 pretty fascinating uh it basically talks about like how um generation long cultural differences are you know playing a role in how people are acting now Mm. kind of thing um and it was actually you being from alabama you might find this interesting it was talking about uh this a study that they did in michigan state university that they 
basically decided that those in the south were more aggressive and more likely to get in a fight under certain conditions than those in the north. Um, What's that and- supposed to mean? <laughs> nothing, <laughs> nothing, Cody. Um, <laughs> but it was because of like where the the immigrants um, came from in Europe that ended up in the mm. south and how Ireland. some of them were um, like cattle farmers versus um crop farmers and how the cattle farmers were always a little bit more aggressive because their cattle could get stolen or killed in the middle of the night so they had to Mm. they had to be more aggressive and basically how that has um determined and kind of influenced generations later um that those the offspring of the offspring kind of thing are still (laughs) are still more aggressive um than their counterparts up north so there's a that uh well i could see that but yeah it's the same thing with well, sure, and sure, and uh, finance as well. So, yeah. like, where I work in a, I work in a fairly good job now. I think it pays pretty well, but a lot of my coworkers don't think that, mm-hmm. and um, they struggle. Oh, know? Okay, gotcha. So, it, like, yeah, it's, it's interesting. they don't think that they get paid very well because they spend it all kind of thing, or um, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you know, again, not in a sense of judgmental, but just the truth. I mean, I see them yeah. come in their day ordering food mm. um, uber eats or whatever you know eating out or they and they smoke a lot of them but it's like definitely to me it's like you realize that's probably at least six hundred dollars a month between those two habits yeah that you could be doing anything with yeah it's like wow but then again you know i, I did those same things you know i mean i know what it means to just completely just throw money out the window and you know i still struggle with that at times but again having a balance is, is very helpful and, and you know having a family me being the sole provider pushes me to be more um, responsible, you know? Yeah. Helps. But yeah, having the balance of a wife who grew up in the complete opposite, like her dad's like, they were like taught to save 70% of everything they had. Mm-hmm. Nice. Yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a solid goal. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's good. So my, I would say that it's come to like, it's good to an extent. Cause like, it's like, it was, and we're just, we are just now getting to the point where we could do this. We can't now because of everything going on in the country, but, yeah, um, you know, she would be even afraid to move money from savings to investing because yeah. so ingrained in that. Whereas like most financial experts say have six months of savings and then yeah. six months you're, you're living in savings and then, you know, you can invest. Yeah. But it's like, uh, it's scary for her, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. I, like I, but yeah, I would rather be on her team way. than on mine, though. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's be- better to have some money than no money, right? <laughs> right. So, you know, they say what the majority of Americans can't, can't take a four hundred dollar emergency. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, wild. And it's and it's funny we come to this culture where we blame everyone for it, but it's like I work in an environment where I see it. It's like, dude, and like I said, I grew up in it. I I mean, my parents struggled. They end up losing their home. Yeah. And both of them made substantially more money than I do now and they lived in, a, in Alabama is cheaper than Indiana Indiana is not expensive but it, mm-hmm. it's way for property taxes wise yeah in, in Alabama and everything really and they didn't make it work largely because they would make poor decisions you know, and then they smoked and stuff like that just like you know and you, you see people and still in my family you know some people still have money issues and it's and it's hard for me to be empathetic because I'm just like dude like you yeah. still smoke cigarettes like you realize how much money that mm-hmm. <laughs> that is i, I think so. one of the, the biggest um things that influenced me was like you know and when i ended up getting a job that you know after the marine corps that wasn't <laughs> wasn't fond of or even b- before the marine corps just realizing that all right i make x number of dollars an hour um and i want to go out to dinner and that's like that's me working this job i hate for two hours to go pay for that dinner it's like man that's not worth it like i'd (laughs) I'd rather you know eat some trail mix kind of thing um yeah but yeah when you kind of put put it into perspective of um you know what it took for you to get that money uh it 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 definitely changes things okay yeah i think so earning it more definitely is a and again and again i think in the same line as being the sole provider it also means like okay what does that mean if i can't Mm. feed one or you know and we're nowhere near that like i said we've been very blessed and we have a great home now and you know everything's good for yeah. now hopefully the layoffs happen <laughs> but, what what industry know, um, are you in right now 
I, I, I work in transportation. I'm a, a locomotive electrician. I think nice. Locomotive. Yeah. Is, is that something that your radar experience um, kind of helped you get, or is that is that not even related to anything you've done before? Yes and no. It, uh, it is related in the sense of uh, electronics or electronics, essentially. Once you learn how to um, do component level troubleshooting and read schematic, you can do most things like that with as far as tech work. Yeah. Obviously, uh, there's no radars on the on the <laughs> on the trains, but uh, yeah. So I mean, in the sense of that, yeah, I would say it helped me get a job just through the electrical component part of it. Gotcha. Just kind of ha you've proven your aptitude in that in that area, essentially. Right. Yeah. And being a vet, I think a lot of companies do like to hire vets because I mean, I <laughs> the cynical side of me says probably because they get a tax break for it <laughs> more than yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> probably. Probably because they get a tax break, let's be honest. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, depending, it, it can mean there's good work ethic there. But I think a, a big myth um, civilians need to dispel is that, you know, we're some different type of people. I mean, you have everyone in the military. You have turds, yeah. you have yeah. You have hard workers, you know. There is the term skating, and it is used by a lot of people. <laughs> you know, and you're like, and it what, what, sucks. What is, you're like, what's oh, skating? Man. Skating is a reference to skating through life, skating through your job. It means you're just breezing through your enlistment. You know how to avoid every hard thing. Like, you know how yeah. to avoid formations. You don't ever volunteer for anything. You, you know, you, you stay in the background. And, uh, you know, like, you know, how, well, you know where all the good hiding spots are at work. You know, that kind of <laughs> yeah. Um, you're the guy that always walks around with the clipboard looking, looking official, but not really doing yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you, know, you know how to get – you know how to get by and not do anything really. Yeah. Is it, uh, is it possible to get promoted and, uh, and do well while excelling at skating or do the skaters typically, um, you know, like, does that prevent them from getting promoted? To be honest with you, it can, but it can also not because yeah. I would say nepotism is just as prevalent in the military as anywhere. Gotcha. Um, you know, or, you know, like, again, fraternization, you know, that's probably one of the reasons why I should be, but there, you know, there are people that they're favorites and you, you see it. I mean, you, I came in the headquarters building a little late, but I, I saw people in the S1 shop getting, you know, getting medals for taking pictures at ceremonies where people had to bust their tails to get the same ones, you know, yeah. and it's like, you know, there's favoritism. When you see people get promoted super fast in those areas and have inflated proficiency and condom marks. And it's like, mm -hmm. you, you know what's happening there. And, yeah. you know, but I mean, what are you going to do? It's a sergeant major. What are, you, what are you doing? You know, it's just like, it's but, unfortunate. And, and so, yeah, but I would say if, if you want to like, you know, what's the probability of excelling mm -hmm. is it possible? Yes. If you have a likable personality and you, you hit the exact specific types of leaders, you can still excel to an extent being a skater. Yeah. But, I mean, don't do you think that the, those, you know, that exists outside of the military too, um, you know, promoting and excelling because you're good with people and you're good with interacting with, you know, brown nosing as some people would call it, you know, <laughs> whoever, whoever the difference next person is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think absolutely. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's always brown nosing at the end of the day. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure the, the most measurable, uh, trait they can find for success and and across all job fields is emotional iq mm. so if you communicate with people and people like you you will do well regardless yeah. and even if you're not a skater I mean, yeah. obviously if you're a skater, you see it but if you're a skater and a hard worker you'll excel even more yeah you know that's a very important trait to have and unfortunately most of that's more born into you or in i think environmentally influenced you can learn things to help with those but yeah absolutely i think if you you're good with people yeah people are going to want to around you and hire you that's just true how it is true yeah regardless of whether true. or not you're actually good at anything other than <laughs> other than communicating but that's a worthwhile skill too so right but awesome it is yeah cool cody well um yeah i mean at you know at the end of the day uh what was it five years for you yeah i did five years five years and now you're you're completely uh free of your your eight-year contract by 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 a couple of years now i guess i'm very thankful right now I don't know if you saw the executive order that got signed a few days ago i did see that i, th I think that was only for um medical like yeah it is know. okay yeah. Other, yeah very specific I, I haven't gotten a call for now so. 
for, for <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah, we won't we won't get into any of your conspiracy theories or anything like that. <laughs> but uh, awesome. Yeah. Well, you're already in them, man. No. Oh. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Anything you would tell those that are uh, you know beginning their journey? Um. Movies, action movies are great. Fun to watch. <laughs> You know, but even if you want to go that route, be, you know, ground side and infantry, special forces, there's probably a lot more annoying things and fun, cool things you see in movies. Yeah. A lot more scars to Gary at the end of it, too. I'm not my personal experience, but people I'm really close with have seen. Um, I highly recommend pursuing a career in the military that you'll enjoy, but also when you get out, we'll have a the fruit of having another job that you can sustain yourself or a family with, Absolutely. you know, don't you want to have as many options for employment as you can, especially nowadays. Yeah. And I would say along that same trail, and this is probably not going to be a very popular thing to say to people, but like the myth of like, you know, follow your dreams and like, dude, <laughs> cool and all man. But if we're going to look at the scope of human existence, people just work to live. Yeah. And so for me, being a good father and a good husband takes precedent over everything but my relationship with God, you know? Yeah. Christ. Um, but so I'm going to do whatever I can do to provide and, and, and be here at the same time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I think it's cool to want to pursue specific careers, but if you're doing it, you're doing it unrealistically, then that's foolish. You know, at the end of the day, like, you're not going to find fulfillment from your job, man. Yeah. It's really stupid to try to do that, honestly. Just get yeah. a job that pays well and has good benefits. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one you don't have to hopefully spend all of your time at and then make the rest of your life worth living, you know? Yeah. I do. I go I go home and I spend time with my, my wife and my kids and, like, I see my coworkers complain all the time about it. And I'm just like, dude, this job is not that bad. And About the job <laughs> or hanging out with their, their wife and kids? <laughs> Both, <laughs> <laughs> both. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's unrealistic to tell everyone to follow their dreams because honestly, some of your dreams are stupid. <laughs> your kid. <laughs> That's quotable right there. <laughs> yeah, it's true. But yeah, just you know, get, pursue a career that if you can, that's fun for you, whatever. But also, do something that'll set you up financially, and and find someone who knows what they're doing financially. And take advantage of everything you can from the military and, and don't feel shame like the whole like you know obviously you don't want to be a user in the sense like that's the only reason you're enlisting that wasn't the only list, reason i enlisted but like yeah it's full to just not pursue those things when they're there for you you know you, you've earned them you're there or can yeah. get your get your degree while you're in you know do your tuition assistance and yeah. knock it at least an associates you know yeah when you get out pursue pursue careers and, and i think it's also important to know like a lot of jobs have a very very wide range of what you can do with them when you get out like I said i i was a radar tech mm -hmm. fix locomotives now yeah <laughs> but it's a good career you know i have great medical and great retirement and it's like if you put tunnel vision on yourself at a at an early start then you're kind of screwing yourself in the long run you know yeah. you want to be able to be flexible so yeah, I mean that's mainly it. You know, have fun. I say have fun, but be smart about it and budget and find someone like yourself that uh, <laughs> this guy was uh, 19 years old and have had ridiculous amounts of money in his savings account already. And I'm just like, what the heck is wrong? Uh, ridiculous is relative, but <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, uh, I'm I mean, not gonna I'm... say the amount, but I bet <laughs> if I said it, <laughs> most people are like what? And you didn't even have a deployment under your belt, so yeah. That's more I mean, and at the end of the day, I mean, that's that's kind of why I want to talk to, um, you know, those that have done it and kind of, because uh, I think it is a problem, you know, that Marines yeah. and Army and whatever branch you're in, uh, there's a lot of people passing up the opportunity to to kind of uh, go lay a good financial foundation. Uh, yeah, man, don't buy a life. freaking new car after you deploy. Yeah. That's crap, dude. <laughs> you can buy a house and, dude, think about it. <laughs> I will not name this person because you're probably going to interview them, but they did <laughs> their deployment stuff and now they got own multiple houses in California. Yeah. Have nice cars. Yeah. So, Hopefully he'll be on be here smart. at some point. Smart. But yeah. Yeah. It's really true. Awesome. Well, thanks Cody. Um, yeah, bro. Good talking to you, but I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to stop recording. Yeah. Here.
Cool. Um, I didn't want 